Hi, I hope everyone is doing well. This is John Kakali, and for my lit review presentation, we're going to be talking about solving the cocktail party problem with machine learning. Quick overview of what we're going to talk about. What is the cocktail party problem, CPP for short, a brief history of the cocktail party problem, how the human mind solves it, attempts that computers have made to solve it, my proposed research, and of course citations. Uh, what is the cocktail party problem? So it's something that most of you are probably familiar with even if you don't realize it. So think about a cocktail party where you have 20, maybe 30 people. Everybody's having their different conversations. People are drinking their drinks. Uh, lots of ambient noise going on. Glasses clinking. Cars driving by. People laughing in the background. Yet if you want to, it is very easy for you to go up to an individual and have a conversation with them and focus in on exactly what they're saying. And when you think about the sonic mechanics involved in that, uh, all of that sound in that room is coming into your ears in the form of a mix, yet your mind has the ability to effortlessly separate all of that sound into the sound that you want to listen to in real time. So. Here's a quote by a gentleman named Colin Cherry, and we'll learn more about him in a minute. He laid the, found, the foundations for uh, really a lot of the research on this and on what logical principles could one design a machine whose reaction in response to speech stimuli would be analogous to that of a human being. And all that's saying is that, is it possible to create a computer or machine that can replicate this behavior? Here's a nice little graphic where you see you know, a mix of waves coming into the ear, brain, separates it into two distinct uh, waveforms. Brief history. So in 1953, Colin Cherry, British uh, auditory scientist, conducted an experiment where he put a, a headphone on, on people. And in one ear, he played various distortional noise. And in another ear, he would play spoken dialogue. And he measured how much people could understand of that dialogue while those distortions were going on. And what he found is that people could actually understand quite a bit. And that laid the foundation for the cocktail party problem as we know it today. And over the years, many more studies have been done on this particular uh, topic. As you can see in these fields right here, there have been many attempts to solve this problem. And while a lot of progress has been made, it is not a solved problem in the sense that you cannot roll a computer or a machine into a cocktail party with 20 or 30 people and have it isolate voices in real time. So potential applications, hearing aids, signal processing and biomedical devices, artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, post-processing effects in music and film, uh, the possibilities are, are many more actually. So I think it's very important to take a look at how nature solves the problems. Oftentimes, the best science simply replicates nature. So how do humans solve it? And really, the mind solves it in a three-phase process, analysis, recognition, and synthesis. Analysis involves the human mind's ability to segment an audio mix into individual channels or streams. Um, studies have shown that this separation is typically driven by dichotically opposed speech characteristics and that's just a very fancy way of saying that the mind uses characteristics like pitch and loudness to, to separate. So here you have a graphic. Uh, here's the mix and the mind separating it in different waves based on things like pitch and loudness. Also, human vision and correlating visual stimuli with audio stimuli is an important component to the analysis phase. Recognition phase. So recognition involves the mind's ability to identify patterns and structures within these segmented sound streams. Uh, the logical principles involved in the recognition space, the, I'm sorry, the recognition phase of speech patterns would imply that the brain contains a store of probability rankings that enables us to make these predictions and identify these patterns. And it's important to realize that this is learned behavior. So I included the graphic of a baby because when babies are born, they don't have this store of probability rankings. They learn this over time. You, you know, when a child is born, they'll respond to loud noises, but they, they can't really respond to speech in the way that we can. But over time, they learn how to do that and they, their minds get better at their recognition phase.
The last phase is synthesis, and that's simply where once the brain completes the first two phases, it actually synthesizes and reconstructs the individual sound wave that it wishes to isolate. And then once it does that, it can focus very clearly on what's being said and process the content therein. So it's important to talk about the challenges the mind has to doing this and certain distortional effects can create significant complications for the mind. So reverberations make it hard to, uh, for the mind to process the cocktail party problem. The Lombard effect, and that's where you go into a restaurant and it's a very high ambient noise level and you have to speak over, over the noise level. That particular condition makes it difficult for the mind to isolate sound. The loss of hearing, if you reduce the number of sensors, essentially from two to one, that makes it difficult for the mind to isolate sound. And when a competing sound is in close proximity to the, the source that you're trying to isolate, that makes it difficult for the mind to process sound. So, how have computers attempted to solve this? Uh, we'll talk about a variety of solutions, and first we're going to talk about directional hearing and sound localization. And what that means is simply what direction the sound's coming from and how far it is away. And what they found, this is actually a very well-researched topic, and what they found is that sound enters the left ear and the right ear at slightly diff in slightly different ways. And so when you compare things like interaural time difference, meaning the, the difference, you know, you see these two waves are kind of out of phase. And so when you measure the distance in that, you can use that as well as the difference in the amplitude between the ear, as well as the difference in the spectral difference. And you can get a pretty good idea of where the sound is coming from and where it's located. Uh, the next technique that I'm going to talk about is auditory scene analysis. And that was uh, a lot of the work for that what came from a guy named Bregman, and he wrote a book in 1994. And that attempts to replicate the mind's ability to group sounds into categories based on certain characteristics. And he subdivided that into two methods of grouping, sequential grouping and simultaneous grouping. Sequential looks for characteristics that evolve over time, like rhythm and melody. And simultaneous grouping involves classifying sounds based on characteristics that that don't really require, that don't really evolve over time, such as pitch and loudness. So there are two models of computer implementation for this technique. One is a data-driven analysis, which simply uses raw data, uh, process, the computers process raw data of the sound's past and present behavior to extract the source. And then there's a really interesting technique that a guy named Ellis, he actually received a PhD for this, and one of the more interesting sources I have uh, is actually his uh, PhD thesis and he used the data to actually recreate a waveform that he used to predict what the sounds will sound like in the future and separate sources based on that so here's a little of the math that was involved in that technique and and I thought that was pretty cool I mean obviously it's you know it's complex stuff and here's a, a nice little chart of uh, one of the charts that he was using so Another technique that I've seen in several of your lit reviews is blind source separation. And what, what that does is that employs Gaussian matrix techniques to separate the sources. They call it blind because in this method, the sound data is, goes through a transform function and is projected on a new axis, a new axis so that one can see the various patterns more clearly. And blind simply refers to the fact that this method projects the data blindly onto an axis, meaning that the axis is driven by a blind projection, not there's a pre-analysis of the data and then the axis is determined from that. So there's two types of blind source separation, independent component analysis, which uses eigenvalue decomposition, and principal component analysis, which uses singular value decomposition. And here's just a little bit of the, the math from that. It, it's very matrix heavy. And here are some of the charts that it outputs and you have to deal with. So there's some significant weaknesses to blind source separation that I want to talk about. One is that it requires the same number of mics as sources you're trying to separate. So a cocktail party of, of 30 people, you're going to need 30 mics. So that's kind of a huge amount of overhead. Uh, math the mathematical framework breaks down when a new audio source joins. So if a new guest just waltzes into the cocktail party, 
your whole framework got flipped upside down and it's very computationally intensive as the system scales in complexity. So that matrix that we saw on the previous slide, that matrix gets bigger and bigger as more and more people join the cocktail party. So obviously there's a critical point where the computer power required to do that, just they just didn't have it back in those days. So it is just impractical for environments that aren't carefully controlled or that are, are very complex. And that's uh, spoken about in these two articles. Now, in 2001, a gentleman named Brian Saggy, I, I think at a college in California, used a neural network to solve this problem. He used fast Fourier transforms to first process the raw sound data, and then he basically selected what are called features, uh, and he taught these features to the artificial neural network, and specifically these features were recognized words and various sound cues. And the result is that the neural network then had the ability to recognize and isolate the sound sources based on this machine learning technique. It produced really good results. First of all, he only needed one mic to do it, which is a massive advantage over blind source separation. And also the results mimicked the results that we saw in humans in Colin Cherry's experiment in 1953, for example, this technique was able to separate sources better based on word recognition as opposed to some, some random sound that he was trying to recognize, which is similar to how humans recognize words, and that's, I'm sorry, similar to how humans separate sources, and that reflects a lot of the early experimental work. So. It, has, it does have some limitations. One is that the neural network was only capable of, of holding 1,024 words, and that's a pretty big limitation when you consider the English language has over 170,000 words. Uh, so my proposed research. One, I wanna point out that machine learning and artificial intelligence technology is far superior today than it was in 2001. As we all know, in 2011, Apple introduced Siri, brought AI to the masses, and in 2017, they took it a step further and introduced something called Core ML across every operating system. And what that is is a framework that allows developers to very easily access the math and functionality that you need to do machine learning. So, and Google and Microsoft did the same thing. So basically, anybody who has a computer can access this functionality. It's also important to point out that MATLAB and Mathematica have this functionality too. In particular, MATLAB has incredible machine learning functionality. If anybody has the time, there are some on-ramp tutorials that are free with the university. Uh, it takes maybe two hours of your time and, and they're just incredible in terms of teaching you what MATLAB can do with that. So how does machine learning work? Uh, first, there's a learning phase. And this is a classic machine learning example. And say you, you want to teach a machine how to separate a, a, a cat versus a dog. So what you do is in the learning phase, you feed it all these pictures of cats and say, well, these pictures of cats have certain features that are unique to the cats. And I'm going to feed that into the neural, neural network and point out what features are unique. And then I'm going to feed it pictures of dogs. And I'm going to point out the features of the dogs that are unique in these pictures. So then you get uh, a new picture, and this is a picture of a husky, and you, you input that into the neural network, and based on what you have taught it, you should get the output that it recognizes that it's looking at a picture of a dog, and that's how that works. So my proposed research is instead of dogs and cats, well, I'm gonna teach it, uh, the features I'm gonna teach it are various vibrational patterns and various words and sound cues, and I'm going to feed those things into the neural network with the goal that if I input a mix of sound, my hope is that it outputs the separated sources. And so that is my goal. Uh, one thing I want to mention, just in terms of some limitations, is that this is a problem that has been worked on literally for the last 60 years. And so it would be pretty unrealistic for me to assume that in you know a month, I can come up with a true solution to the cocktail party problem. So I am ambitious, but I also am realistic. So uh, I hope that none of you expect for me to do that. But what I do hope to do is expand on Brian Saggy's work in a meaningful way. And I hope 
to add to just the knowledge base concerning how one can use machine learning to tackle this problem. And perhaps I can build on that. So these are my citations and that's my presentation. Thank you very much. My email is jon.kakley at gmail.com. If you want to email me any questions at all, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much for listening.